Hello and welcome to Podcast Stories. Hey, Bill speaking. I muttered into the phone, feeling the pressure of wrapping up the final tweaks to the project specs. Mondays were always a scramble, with clients tossing in last-minute changes like they were tossing confetti, leaving me to pick up the pieces. Hey there, it's me. My wife's voice crackled through the receiver, tinged with the strain of a busy day. Just wondering when you'll be back home tonight. Ever the orchestrator, she thrived on keeping our chaotic schedules in sync, making sure everything ran like a well-oiled machine. I'm not sure, I muttered absently, concentrating on working with the CAD program. Joe had just given me a stack of the latest changes for Johnson's project, which needed to be sent to the contractor by evening. With any luck, we'll be done in a couple of hours. But I advise you not to wait for me for dinner. If it's too late, I promise that Heather will make an order for both of us. My boss's annoying habit of staying late at the last minute has led to arguments between us more than once. I work as an architect for a company that deals with large commercial projects. Five years ago, I was promoted to project manager, which brought a good pay raise but also meant more work and more hours. Days like today remind me to put things on hold to complete urgent tasks. Time is of the utmost importance, late provision of plans to builders can lead to significant consequences for the company. In addition, it could lead to financial penalties for myself, since my firm had a strict policy against project managers who did not complete work on time. The problem was compounded by the lack of advanced notification of urge of projects and the difficult business environment of the last few years when my team was overwhelmed by its own achievements. By completing many complex projects for demanding clients, our team has gained a solid reputation as a service provider. Clients have often asked us to complete their projects precisely because of our track record. This led to the fact that I had to target numerous picky customers and accept their changes at the last minute. Despite the unreasonable demands of the clients, my boss still expected me to fulfill them. Although he privately acknowledged the behavior of clients as outrageous, he publicly urged me to fulfill my duties. He seems to have been convinced by the high fees the firm charged customers for every inconvenience our team faced. As a result, my team received generous bonuses and was respected but the long hours of work did not give us peace of mind. Personally, it is very important for me to spend time with my family and be present in my children's lives. That week, I finally defended my point of view and informed the boss that adjustments needed to be made. The excessive number of working hours affected the effectiveness of our team, and I risked losing valuable team members if the changes were not implemented. Reluctantly, he agreed to meet and discuss setting a more reasonable time frame. I didn't understand why I was so worried about my overtime, especially since she also worked a lot as a financial analyst. I tried not to complain, realizing that sometimes extra hours are necessary for additional responsibility and salary. We have both learned to adapt to the demands of our work. We both consciously tried to give preference to family vacations rather than work, but the constant complaints were already beginning to take their toll. Heather assured me with a touch of sarcasm that she would give me anything I wanted and jokingly told me to try to get home before midnight. I quickly said goodbye and went back to work on the computer. Looking back, I realized that I hadn't noticed the subtle hints in her voice. I was only half listening to her because I couldn't wait to get the assignment done and go home. Maybe I should have paid more attention to her words. On reflection, I realized that the way she expressed her opinion was crucial. Later, it dawned on me that this phone call represented a classic dilemma with no clear solution. If I had interrupted work to talk to her, it would have delayed the completion of the current task and she would have been upset about my late return home. But if I had hurried to start the conversation in a clearly worried manner, she would have felt that she was being neglected. Whichever approach I chose, it only confirmed her concerns about what I was focusing on. It was an unfavorable start to what would later turn out to be the most terrible evening of my life. I realized that I stopped paying attention to her, and she hates being ignored. All I managed to do was upset her. I didn't even pay attention to her comment about Heather. Heather joined my team as a personal assistant right after graduating from college about three years ago. Getting her to work was one of the smartest decisions I made when assembling my team. Although I was doing a great job as an architect, my management skills needed to be improved. Heather had the business and organizational skills that I lacked, and she was the one who quietly ensured smooth operation behind the scenes. Our skills were perfectly combined, organically complementing each other. Without her, my team would hardly have achieved half the success we have achieved. But Heather unwittingly became a source of tension between us. 
Although she never spoke about it directly, she had enough subtle hints to let me know that, in her opinion, I hired her only because of her appearance. At 25, Heather was undeniably attractive and reminded me of a younger version of my wife when we first got married three years ago. She quickly appreciated Heather and immediately disliked her. Looking back, I realized that she felt threatened because of my close relationship with Heather, but I was inattentive and did not notice the alarm signals. All I've seen is Heather's valuable contribution to the team. As my assistant, she was always by my side in the office and at the facilities, helping me to be organized and focused. I never thought about how one might take this situation, perhaps this was not a serious cause for concern. Our relationship had been strained for a long time, we both avoided topics that could lead to disagreements, allowing unresolved issues to drag on. Although one had never accused me of infidelity, I could sense her suspicions. In response, I stopped mentioning Heather, fearing that it would only lead to more friction. The irony was that I didn't have a romantic interest in Heather, rather, she was like a younger sister to me. I admired Heather's enthusiasm and energy, but the lack of common interests became apparent during our conversations on long car trips. I recognized her beauty, but I didn't dwell on it, my wife was the only woman for me, and I didn't want to look for someone else. I thought that men who chase young trophy wives were stupid. I had friends from the country club who abandoned their wives only to show up with an artificial doll next to them, and I couldn't help but shake my head at their stupidity. I didn't understand what was attractive about such a superficial relationship. From afar, I caught a calculating gleam in the eyes of women who extracted everything they could from their rich benefactors. Unlike them, I cherished the full and meaningful life I shared with my partner. Despite periodic disagreements, we had strong and mutually beneficial partnerships. I wasn't worried about her intentions because we both contributed to our successful life together. Our bond was based on sincere love and mutual respect, she was the one I imagined growing old with, and that was all I needed. After completing the edit, I sent the updated drawings to the contractor around 8 o'clock in the evening, feeling relieved. I stretched and turned off the computer and then left the office with the rest of the team. We all hurried home, trying to make the most of the remaining evening hours. By the time I got home, the phone call had completely slipped my mind. All I could think about was getting home and relaxing. Fortunately, I managed to avoid the worst traffic jams, and I arrived home before 9 o'clock in the evening. Before I went to my room, I stopped by Lacey's for a minute. I waved at her, noticing that she was staring at her phone. I couldn't believe it, at the age of 12, she was already so addicted to this device. I had just poured myself a drink and was sitting on the couch to relax in front of the TV when she came in and sat on an armchair, looking at me. I realized that my relaxation plans were about to be disrupted. She usually sat next to me on the couch to cuddle, so her decision to sit in the chair meant she had something important to discuss. I sighed and looked in her direction, her body language was incomprehensible. It was clear that she was nervous about something, but my belated return gave her time to boil over, which resulted in a hint of anger. Bill, she began slowly, I do not know how to soften this blow, so I will just say the following, I want to get a divorce. I was stunned, despite our previous problems. I had no idea that they had reached such an extent. What I stuttered, you can't be serious. What's going on? I asked quietly. She avoided looking me in the eye. I sat there, studying her expression. My mind immediately rushed to analyze my actions, trying to figure out what could have caused such a reaction. All I could think about was Heather, she must have come to the conclusion that I was unfaithful. Can we discuss this? I begged, feeling desperate. We've been together for 15 years. Shouldn't we at least try to sort things out? She sighed and shook her head. I'm really sorry, Bill. I have made a decision. I felt a pang of regret when she added, it's not because of what you did. Our relationship has gradually deteriorated over the years, and I think it would be beneficial for both of us to break up and start over, she said. Despite the fact that I have known her for 15 years, I realized from her behavior that she was hiding something from me. I couldn't pinpoint exactly what it was. I expressed this to her, expressing my disappointment. Our bond may not be as strong as it used to be, but it's something we can work on together if we want to. I demanded to know what was really bothering her and what was going on. Is she accusing me of infidelity? She blushed at my words and nervously clasped her fingers. Guilt radiated from every pore of her body, and it was impossible to deny it. 
When I finally woke up from the harsh reality of what was happening, a curse escaped my lips, uttered in a low whisper, you're betraying me, I accused, feeling the weight of her infidelity weigh on me. The deafening silence that followed confirmed my worst fears. I sat stunned, trying to figure out what had gone wrong. I wouldn't have thought in a million years that she would be capable of such deception. Confusion clouded my thoughts, and the despair of trying to save our marriage quickly evaporated. I began to doubt whether it was worth saving anything at all. I could feel the anger pulsing in me. Who is he? I demanded, my voice straining. I'm sorry, Bill, she said softly. It just happened. It's not because of what you did. He just knocked me down, and we want to be together. I cut her off abruptly, not wanting to listen to her excuses. Who is he? She hesitated before whispering, Alan Johnson. Alan Johnson, a chatty jerk who sold securities at his firm, had been working there for about five years. I met him and his wife several times at parties. I didn't like him at all, in my opinion, there was only style in him, but there was no essence. I didn't believe he had a single genuine quality. Johnson? Are you choosing him over me? I can't believe it. Besides, he's married, you're ruining his marriage too, I exclaimed indignantly. She looked at me, torn between guilt and anger at my harsh words. In the end, anger got the better of her, and she replied fervently, Yes, Bill. He's leaving his wife too, and we'll be together. I'm trying to be calm and avoid quarrels, but it looks like you won't let that happen, will you? I decided to file for divorce because I found someone else. Her words struck me to the core, causing the initial emotional reaction to fade and be replaced by cold, calculating anger. I calmly considered the possible options, realizing that if I succumbed to emotions and pounced on him as my instincts demanded, then nothing would work. It seemed impossible to have a meaningful conversation with her to deal with the mental pain caused by her revelations. I decided to isolate myself from her and approach the situation as coldly as possible. The mental anguish I was experiencing made me close my emotions and shut myself off from her. I surrounded my anger with a protective shell and looked at her with indifference. Well, that's all right. If she wants to get divorced, let her get divorced. This will save me from having to initiate it myself. I was intrigued by her reaction to my words. Despite the fact that she tried to distance herself from me, she could not hide the reproach of my willingness to let her into the house. It was obvious that she was more contradictory than it might seem at first glance and was not completely sure of the correctness of the path she had chosen. When she began to utter the usual platitudes, I sat and reflected on her true feelings, listening only half. It was obvious that she didn't want to offend me, but all this nonsense she was talking about trying to spare my feelings was transparent. She was still pretending to care about me, still insisting on friendship, on all those fake conversations about happiness. I couldn't bring myself to least and. I don't think any of us really believed it, so I was lost in my thoughts for a while, trying to make sense of what had just happened. It was only natural that it took me a while to get back to reality when she awkwardly changed the subject. Replaying her words in my head, I was sure that I had overlooked something very important. I asked in disbelief, and she gave me an annoyed look. I mentioned that we need to develop a plan for further action. I understand that this may take you by surprise, so feel free to stay in the guest room for a few days until you figure out your life situation, she repeated. I was shocked. How dare she? After she cheated on me and asked for a divorce, does she expect me to leave? No way. I'm not stupid enough to buy into that. I firmly stated that I would not go anywhere. Why should I leave? You're the one who wants a divorce, she seemed surprised by my answer. She was surprised when I contradicted her, but I couldn't help but laugh bitterly when I cut her off. Did she really think that I would just leave? What was her plan of action? I chuckled mockingly. Was Alan supposed to fly in and take over? And hinted that I was up to something, but I didn't fall for it. This is my home, and no one is going to come and replace me. If she wants to go to him, then good luck. I won't stand in her way. I don't deserve to be treated like this, and I refuse to back down. You're the one who ruined our marriage, so you should be responsible for the consequences, not me, I said firmly, fixing her with a hard look. My anger started to boil up again. Go away, live with your boyfriend. I don't care. You can leave tonight. I don't care, she looked at me dumbfounded and then stammered, what about the girls? This is their home. I shook my head in disbelief. Are you worried about the girls now? What's wrong with them? 
I asked. I'm not going to let you off the hook that easily. Maybe you were thinking about them while you were having fun, but I'm not going to let some jerk take my place in this house, much less in their lives. He abandoned his own children, and I won't let him near mine. If you want to run away with your lover, be my guest, but the children will stay with me. You can visit them, but you will have to face the consequences of destroying our family, I said angrily. I will never forbid you to see the children, but I want to make it clear that I do not want to see this jerk next to them. Annie. I'm going to give you the choice you wanted to make with me. You can stay in the guest room with the kids while we sort out this mess, but I won't be offended at all if you decide to leave my life now, I suggested. I won't let you kick me out of my own house or wean me from my children, she screamed. After that, our conversation got heated, and we started throwing accusations at each other. I was beside myself with rage. How dare she shout, argue, and call names like that? I was furious. I couldn't believe that she had such a low opinion of me that she could try to step over me. I shuddered to think how this would have ended if Lacey hadn't come downstairs to find out what was going on. The sight of her in the doorway, watching in horror as her parents started screaming, was enough to bring us both back to reality. I want to believe that we were good parents, but at that moment, it was all thrown out the window. One look at Lacey was enough to shift our attention from the problems to what really matters. We both agreed that we want to protect our children from being at the center of our conflicts. The only solution to end the argument was to distance ourselves from her. I quickly came up with an excuse to end the conversation later and invited Lacey to join me upstairs for a chat. It was my responsibility to tell the girls the news. If they were going to stay with me, I couldn't count on someone else to tell them that they would move in with her. I knew it would be hard for them to hear this news. I wanted to break the news of the impending divorce to them as gently as possible. I escorted her upstairs and noticed Sarah cautiously peeking out from behind her bedroom door. It was clear that she had heard our argument. I invited her to join us. When we entered Lacey's room, the conversation that followed was difficult for all of us, and I won't go into details. I tried to keep the conversation delicate despite the anger and harsh words we had exchanged earlier. I understood how important it was for both parents to show love for the girls. I tried not to belittle anyone. Maybe sometimes I let myself get mad at her, but I deliberately tried not to discuss the root of our problems. I thought now was the time to figure out what led to our problems. It was important to me that the girls didn't feel pressured into choosing sides during this difficult time. When they demanded more information, I simply explained that my mom and I had problems that we couldn't overcome and were going to break up. I tried to convince them that they were not the cause of our difficulties and that we both still cherish them very much. As expected, the girls did not take the news very well. We were all caught off guard, none of us expected this. When Lacey demanded an explanation, I could only shrug my shoulders in disbelief. I didn't want to admit to the girls that mom had found someone else. Instead, I just said that I was upset and just as puzzled as they were. In the end, the girls cried their eyes out, and I left them lying on Lacey's bed. I covered them with a blanket and wearily went downstairs. I was grateful to her for not trying to join the conversation. She'll have a chance to talk to the girls later. With a heavy feeling in my heart, I stopped on the landing. The thought of returning to the living room terrified me. I didn't want to continue arguing with her this evening, but I knew I had to talk to her. We needed to discuss how our breakup would affect the girls. When I entered the living room, I noticed how quickly she put away her mobile phone. I assumed she was talking to that jerk Johnson, telling him what had happened. Normally, this would have angered me, but at that moment, I was too exhausted to worry. It was a clear sign that the marriage had come to an end. Judging by the tear stains around her eyes, she was crying too. When I sat down, she looked up at me nervously. I was puzzled for a moment before I realized the reason for her concern. She was worried that I had told the girls about her affair with Johnson. She was afraid that I had let my anger get the better of me and put all the blame on her. She was afraid that I was manipulating the situation to turn the girls against her. I shook my head in disbelief. Well, that's it. You should have trusted me more. I may be mad at you right now, but it's important to remember that you are the mother of our children. They depend on both of us. I'm not going to turn the girls against you, I said firmly. Let's set the basic rule right now. We can get divorced, but the kids can't. I refuse to involve them in our differences. I will not speak ill of you in their presence, and I expect the same from you. Let's deal with this in an adult way, keep it between us, and make it as easy as possible for the kids. 
My ex-wife nodded in agreement. What did you tell them? She asked. I just told them that we were facing difficulties in our relationship and decided to go our separate ways. If you feel the need to share the truth about what really happened, then go ahead. Personally, I don't think it's necessary to disclose it at the moment. If you want to confess, the decision is yours. Just please don't paint me as an enemy. I finished my last glass and thought about getting another one. The temptation was strong, but I knew that drowning my grief was not the way out. Exhausted, I massaged my neck and looked at her wearily. I can't handle it today. Another quarrel will only get in the way of the children. Why don't you get everything you need from the bedroom right now? I want to go to bed, I said, expecting a quarrel. To my surprise, she just nodded and headed upstairs. At that moment, I didn't care if she stayed or left. A few minutes later, she returned downstairs with a small bag and a sad look. I'll call the girls tomorrow and let them know when I'm coming to get the rest of my things. I'm going to stay with a friend for a few days, she said. I snorted in response. I assumed she was going to Johnson's. She looked like she wanted to say something, but instead turned away and quietly left. When she opened the door, I heard her whisper sadly, Bill, I'm so sorry, and disappeared before I could answer. I stared at the wall for a while. Then, I lay down in my empty bed and spent the night staring at the ceiling, trying to figure out where my life went awry. In the following weeks, it turned into a nightmare. I found myself in a cycle of arguments and bickering that seemed to be getting out of my control. The next day, I took time off from work and informed my boss that I needed a few personal days to deal with the crisis that had just begun. Although my boss was unhappy, he was sympathetic to my situation. Cho, who had a difficult divorce in the past, advised me on what to do in this situation. Being a staunch supporter of the Women Can't Be Trusted Club, he willingly shared tips on how to win the divorce process and even advised a reliable, aggressive lawyer who could help me. I was advised to take measures to preserve my property, and I decided to talk to my daughters. They were worried at first when they realized that their mother was not at home in the morning, but they were reassured by her promise to contact them. I assured them that we would discuss the situation later in the day. Although they wanted to stay at home, I decided that it was better for them to go to school so as not to dwell on the divorce. I wanted them to be busy with school chores. Just as a precaution, I contacted the school administration to inform them of the situation, and they offered the girls a counselor they could talk to if necessary. Maybe I was too trusting because I didn't even imagine that someone might try to take the girls away from me. I underestimated the situation and didn't think it would go this far. Fortunately, she didn't do that. She took the girls out of school but only to talk to them. She even called me so I wouldn't worry when they didn't get home on time. I paced back and forth restlessly, full of anxiety until finally, I saw her car pull up to the house. I felt nothing but pity for her, especially after I learned the new information I had received the day before. I guessed what had led her to this decision, and I was furious. A few hours earlier, Claire Johnson, Alan's wife, unexpectedly came to see me. She came to tell me about her husband's scandalous affair. Claire had been following them for months, gathering all sorts of evidence that she wanted to share with me. She managed to get photos and videos of their life together, but I politely declined her offer to show them to me. I didn't want to witness the creepy details or see my wife with Alan Johnson. The few photos she showed me in intimate moments were enough to make me feel sick. I didn't need any more proof of her betrayal. But the most painful thing was that Claire tacitly expected me to already know about her affair. When I started talking about it, Claire said that she had run into both of them at lunch the day before. Alan didn't leave her, she asked him to leave. The worst part was that she had explicitly warned him that she was going to tell me too. He knew that they had been caught and that Claire had evidence that she would soon hand over to me. Claire's bombshell confession left me stunned. Now everything became clear why the wife suddenly asked for a divorce. She knew that Claire would tell about their affair. She tried to pull herself together and broke up with me before I knew the truth. The deceptiveness of her behavior was shocking, it was unmistakably callous and deceitful. She tried to trick me into leaving the house while hiding her guilt. What puzzled me was that it all didn't add up. I never considered her to be selfish or scheming. I began to doubt if I really knew her. Yet, Nervously waiting for her to return with the girls, I made a decision, if she could treat me so callously, then I wouldn't hold back either. I would have kept my promise not to involve the children in this, but otherwise, I was ready for a fight. I decided to follow Joe's advice and make her pay for the divorce. 
In the meantime, I started to find small ways to make her worry and upset. I wanted to get back at her for all the trouble she caused me. I'm sure many of you have already gone through a difficult breakup. You understand how tempting it is to succumb to your dark instincts and take revenge. The us versus them mentality takes over when you start attacking your ex-partner. To deal with resentment, you engage in meaningless arguments just to get a response, which triggers an endless cycle of retaliatory actions and end. I found ourselves in such a devastating situation. We responded to every taunt or insult with a counterattack, which led to a vicious cycle of back and forth. We reacted without thinking, just responding to each other's actions. It seemed necessary for us to fight back because an action could be perceived as a sign of weakness. As a result, such toxic dynamics only added fuel to the fire of resentment between us. Our behavior was similar to that of the Hatfields and the McCoys. Our conflicts steadily intensified, leading us down a destructive path to a bitter divorce where every aspect would be fiercely contested, starting with custody of our daughters. Just when the situation seemed hopeless, Laura intervened. She was my rock, always ready to offer unwavering support and tough love when I needed it most. Despite the fact that she was technically my cousin, Laura was more like a twin sister to me. To say that our relationship was special is to say nothing. We often joke that we look like twins separated at birth who have different mothers. To truly understand the depth of our bond, we must first understand the unique circumstances of our upbringing. Our parents, who are themselves a fascinating story of human interests, are identical twins, each of whom has found love with another identical twin. Having raised their twin bond to a new level, our parents decided to arrange a joint wedding ceremony and honeymoon. And as fate would have it, nine months later, Laura and I were born, the living embodiment of our parents' extraordinary love story. Our mothers coincidentally conceived a child at the same time, and they went into labor at the same time. I can imagine them in adjacent beds, synchronizing contractions. Laura appeared first, and the doctor hurried to deliver her and cut the umbilical cord, and then moved on to helping me deliver. Laura always teased me that she was ten minutes older than me. She's been a constant presence in my life for as long as I can remember. Laura's family lived across the street from mine, and our yards were directly connected. In fact, we treated the courtyards and the two houses as one common space, essentially creating a second home and a family. Her parents were like family to me, and vice versa. I even remember how our moms sometimes took turns breastfeeding us, but I never objected. Having two moms made me feel incredibly happy. Aunt Cindy and Uncle Bill, after whom I was named, the same way Laura was named after my mother, always treated me as if I were their own child. Even now, I sometimes refer to Aunt Cindy as mom. Surprisingly, she takes it as a compliment, and Uncle Bill doesn't seem to mind. This is not so surprising considering that genetically I was more like their child, while Laura was the child of my own parents. No wonder we ended up acting like twins. Laura's house seemed like a second home to me, and I probably spent as much time there as I did in my own house. And when I wasn't in her house, she was in mine, we were practically inseparable. I was told that when we were kids, the easiest way to get us to take a nap was to let us cuddle up to each other like a pair of puppies. This may seem unusual to some, but I grew up in two families with four parents. While no one is jumping to conclusions, let me make it clear that there was never anything inappropriate between our parents, rest assured. Even identical twins had enough differences that we could easily tell them apart. We always knew who was who. There has never been anything romantic between Laura and me. She wasn't just my best friend, she was like a twin sister to me. Our bond was so strong that it felt like we had twins. The thought of kissing her was like kissing myself in female form, and I don't like that. From elementary to high school, Laura and I were always together. We were teased by others, but we always had each other's backs. I've stood up for Laura more times than I can count, and she's done the same for me. Our friendship was built on loyalty and support, not on anything else. If a guy or a girl couldn't accept both of us as friends, in the end, they didn't get either of us. By high school, we had different interests, but we still spent most of our time together. As a result, we became part of a tight-knit group of friends who enjoyed each other's company. It was nice when someone looked out for me and didn't let me do stupid things. Laura always had my back, and I tried to protect her too. Our friends quickly realized that we were completely open with each other and didn't keep any secrets. If the boy wanted to let Laura know that he liked her, he just had to tell me about it. The same was true of Laura, who introduced me to most of my school friends. After graduation, we went our separate ways. 
we discussed the possibility of applying to the same college, but our scholarship offers did not match. Despite this, we continued to communicate on the phone. As a result, Laura enrolled in medical school, where she met her husband, Ree. Now they both work in a family practice in the neighboring suburb where I live. I continue to see Laura often and talk to her on the phone every day. She remains my most trusted confidant, even closer than my own sister. When everything went wrong, Laura was the first person I turned to for support. She empathized with me and shared my resentment of betrayal. She also offered a different point of view than my boss, Joe, who pushed me to be more aggressive in my divorce. The turning point came about three weeks later. I went to a lawyer recommended by Joe and had several meetings with him to discuss my priorities and concerns. It was extremely important for him to understand that the main thing for me was my daughters. I categorically stated my desire to obtain custody, knowing full well that this could lead to a serious conflict. Unfortunately, his forecast was not optimistic. Local courts were known for giving preference to mothers in custody disputes, regardless of the father's involvement in child rearing. If the mother was considered in good shape, she usually received custody. It turned out that the only way out for me was to agree to a soft visiting agreement. Another option that presented itself to me was to show aggression and tarnish her reputation to get at least some chance of custody. I had to completely ruin her image and present her as an incompetent mother. It was proposed to file for divorce because of the affair and present all the evidence that Claire Johnson found. This was done to show that keeping in touch with Johnson would put the girls and ends care at risk. In addition, the goal was to show that and had neglected her duties by leaving the family. In fact, to get at least some chance of custody, I needed to sever Anne's connection with the girls. The fact that I did not immediately reject his offer but informed him that I would think about it is a clear sign of my despair and mindset. During lunch with Laura, I reluctantly shared his suggestions, feeling depressed at the thought of having to do them. I was uncomfortable with this situation, but I felt that I had no other way out. I didn't want to involve the girls in this, but my conflict with her reached a point where I felt obligated to fight back, especially since I knew she wanted custody. I no longer thought about what was fair or ethical, I was focused solely on winning. Fortunately, Laura was there to guide me in the right direction. She was aware of all the details of my dispute with her, heard about every complaint, and every response in great detail. Laura had reached the limit, and the custody dispute was the last straw. Aren't you tired of it yet? She asked, giving me an annoyed look. What is it? Your revenge? Isn't it time for you to grow up and forget about this petty childishness? I couldn't resist and, imitating my whiny childish voice, protested, she started it. Laura groaned at my antics and grinned in despair. Oh no, not this time. You're not going to get away with this so easily. Listen to me. I've been listening to your complaints and lamentations about what she's done to you for the last three weeks. It's time to grow up and move on. Instead of reacting emotionally, start using your brain. It was only at that moment that I realized Laura was sincere. I thought she was joking, trying to distract me from my problems. Laura's expression was serious as she spoke. Bill, I understand that you are upset and suffering. You have every right to do that. I'm upset about it too, but please, for God's sake, leave it alone. Don't let your emotions trap you in a difficult situation. It may not be easy, but it's important to focus on the future and not dwell on the past, she said, seeing my confusion. She added softly, if your marriage is falling apart, it doesn't mean you have to participate in a devastating divorce. There is still time to determine what your life will be like after the divorce. Think about how you want to see yourself in a few years. Do you really want to become bitter and hostile like Joe? Do you really want to get to a point where you and your ex will be constantly feuding? I regret to inform you that the path you are currently following is dangerous. The way both you and your partner behave is leading you both to the point of no return. Your anger clouds your judgment and forces you to play cruel games that will only lead to bitterness and resentment. If this continues, you may end up despising each other, the way Joe despises his ex. After all, the only people who will benefit from your divorce are lawyers. Think about how your actions will affect your children. How will a dirty divorce affect them? These questions haunted me. My boss, Joe, thought he was lucky to have the opportunity to see his son and daughter twice a year, despite obstacles from his ex that made regular visits problematic. Laura noticed the suffering on my face and gently asked me to think about the consequences. Do I want to experience the same pain? 
Do I want to inflict this pain on my children if I decide to divorce, as this manipulator suggested? Then inevitably, someone will suffer greatly, and Sarah and Lacey will be the most likely victims. It's impossible to stop them from finding out what happened, the conflict will inevitably force them to take sides. They will see you pointing the finger and accusing each other of divorce and will most likely seek revenge by portraying you as villains. It is likely that in the end, they will take offense at someone and become unwitting participants in this ongoing feud. This situation is detrimental to all participants. When you stress the importance of both parents to the girls that first evening, that was probably the last wise word you said. Can't you see the damage you're doing with your actions? Laura continued. This situation is not just about you and her. Think about Sarah and Lacey too. They will need both of you in the future. Laura's words struck a chord with me, and I realized that she was right. Accusing me of harming children was not a serious blow, but it caught my attention. She saw the doubts and guilt I've been feeling since I left the lawyer's office. So, what do you suggest I do? I asked, feeling defeated. Maybe I should just give up custody and hope for visitation rights. It's a win-win situation. Laura sighed, shaking her head. There's another way out, but your lawyer doesn't seem to notice it. All he knows is how to fight and scratch. Re mentioned that his friend asked if you had considered sharing custody, the courts will approve this if both sides are willing to cooperate. I believe that we have a chance to work together, but we need to start now, stop the feud before it's too late, she urged. You have to take the first step and ask for a truce. Maybe if you sit down and discuss everything like adults, you can come to a decision that suits both of you. You both love these girls to death, and you are both wonderful parents. If you can be polite to each other for a few hours, I think you can come to a decision. Laura smiled. In the end, the only thing you both still agree on is the welfare of the girls. If you don't want to do it for yourself, do it for them. I mumbled something while thinking about it. Her idea gave me hope that I hadn't had before. I didn't dare let myself worry too much until I found out if such a possibility was real. In any case, I decided to contact my lawyer and consider the possibility of joint custody. Laura's words caused a flurry of thoughts in my head, and I tried to turn our conversation to lighter topics, but Laura was persistent and continued to interfere in my affairs. She seemed determined to speak out, even when the girls and Ree were worried. When will you get out of this state and stop feeling sorry for yourself? You've been going through a divorce for too long. It's not the end of the world. You need to move forward and focus on what lies ahead. Think about the future, Laura advised. Instead of getting angry like Joe, who can't trust anyone, try to see the positives, she advised. And what are the advantages? I asked gloomily. Well, if you manage the situation correctly, you will have more opportunities than you can imagine, Laura stated bluntly. I stared at her in disbelief. She always managed to catch me off guard with her bold statements, but it was unexpected. When I was younger, love and dating were common topics of discussion. Laura was there to guide me during my first steps into the world of relationships. In a sense, she acted as my informant in the mysterious world of women. Laura gave me practical advice on how to please girls. I tried to explain to her what boys are, just as she tried to explain what girls are, but when we turned 15, we stopped playing this game. And then she started again. First, she called me names for ruining my girlfriend's future, and now she's giving out advice for broken hearts. What's next, is he going to date me again? She noticed my reaction and grinned. I knew it would get your attention, she grumbled. You should take it as a chance, not a setback. How many divorced and middle-aged widows are there in our club? How many men do you know who have broken up wonderful marriages for younger women? They're all just waiting for you, Laura grinned. Some of them are practically jumping for joy after it became known about your breakup. Several of my friends even asked about you. I can name at least six women who are happy to comfort you. I must have looked skeptical because she sighed in disappointment. Don't you understand? Many women find themselves in the same situation as you. It doesn't matter if their husbands are cheating on them or they have been replaced by a younger model, they are looking for someone who understands their pain and can become a reliable confidant. You can become an ideal couple for them, a reliable man who is looking for a reliable partner. And don't forget that you're in great shape and you don't look too bad, Laura grinned. Give these women a chance and they will fall at your feet. I laughed, though with a touch of bitterness. Exactly, I'm a stud, then let my wife stay with Alan Johnson, that idiot, I muttered. 
Laura just shook her head mockingly. You're a stupid, stupid person. You've been wrong so many times it's hard to even say where to start, she sighed theatrically. Okay, let's start with what obviously bothers you the most, your pride. Is your ego really that fragile, she asked. Do you really think that everyone will mock you because you were betrayed? Let's move on. Not only do these women not care, but many of them have most likely experienced similar situations. Believe me, they probably had more serious self-esteem problems than you. I don't want to upset you, but most likely making love has nothing to do with why she started an affair. Has she ever complained about being in love with you? Unlike men, most women don't have affairs solely for sexual reasons. As a rule, some deep reason leads to intimate activity and not the lovemaking itself as a catalyst. So don't worry about someone leaving you because of your efficiency in bed. This has nothing to do with your ability to please a woman. If you remember at least half of what I shared with you when we were younger, then you're probably better than most of the men I've come across. In my opinion, you are most likely superior to a person like the egocentric Johnson. You don't have to be a god of love to be good enough, Laura said. The women you should be interested in are more concerned about what's here, Laura pointed to his head, and here, she pointed to his chest, than what you're wearing, there she pointed to his crotch. You really have nothing to worry about. I care about you, brother, but sometimes you can be ignorant. What do you think these women are looking for? Do you really think they only want a casual fling? Women our age want more. They need someone kind, someone they can really communicate with, she said with a smile. They're looking for someone who sees them as real people, not just a temporary toy. They crave a little romance and someone who will raise their self-esteem. You meet all these requirements, kind, reliable, and trustworthy. Stable work and intelligence only add to your attractiveness. You can have meaningful conversations, so my friends are eager to get to know you better. And if you're also great in bed, then that's just an added bonus, Laura explained enthusiastically. No one will judge you for being abandoned by someone. The most difficult thing is to prevent a date from turning into a bullying session with your ex. If you mention her, everyone will think that your ex was a fool to cheat on you and leave you, and they will be right, Laura frankly said that my wife was a fool and would soon realize it. The great thing is that if you want to get back at her, you don't have to do anything but be yourself. Maybe she hasn't figured it out yet, but she will, Laura concluded sadly. I bet a case of wine that, in a few years, she will be unhappy. Her encouraging speech lifted my spirits a little, and I definitely perked up at her last words. She noticed this and laughed maliciously, leaning closer. Just think, she was jealous and didn't trust you just because you hired a young assistant. How would she feel about a real man who, in her opinion, is cheating on her? It was inevitable that she would deceive him in return. She traded you for something useless. You shouldn't make yourself unhappy during the divorce just to get back at her. If you really want her to regret what she did, just keep living your life and be true to yourself. You will be able to handle the situation gracefully because you have the opportunity to emerge victorious. You might even find a little joy in the process, she concluded. After thinking a little, I realized that I had heard Laura's words and understood her intentions towards our daughters. What happens if my daughters find out about the reason for our divorce? What happens if they find out the truth that their mother was unfaithful to their father? I asked. Laura was silent, confirming my suspicions that she had no answer. Let me tell you what's going to happen. They will be hurt and sad, but they deserve to know the truth despite their young age. I consider it important to explain to them the circumstances that led to the divorce, I answered. She cheated not only on me but also on the father of her daughters and abandoned her family. She'll get what she deserves. I will make sure that our family members and friends find out the truth. You said that I would end up despising my unfaithful wife, why should I feel any different? She betrayed me. Why should I show fake empathy when I can express my true feelings? Do you think a man should pretend that he doesn't hate an unfaithful woman? I continued, threateningly. As love is a pure emotion, so is hate. After everything she has done to me, she will receive my most sincere feelings. I will also fight for custody of my children. She played games, and now it's time for her to face the consequences, I declared. Laura remained silent. One last question remains. You mentioned that my daughters need a mother. I understand the importance of a mother figure in their lives, but is my cheating wife really the best option for them? Just because she gave birth to them, breastfed them, and took care of them so far, does that make her an ideal choice? 
how can I accept a morally compromised woman as the best role model for my children? I asked. Who will be the best example for my daughters? Will it be a woman who cheats, gets divorced, takes children and money from her ex-husband, and starts an affair with a new partner? Or will it be a divorced father who confronts a cheating woman in court? It's time to think about what values we want to instill in our children. Let's think about the impact these actions will have on my daughters. Let's choose a positive role model for them. Let's make the right decision for their future. Let my daughters come first. Let's choose Laura's version, I suggested. Are they also unintelligent, or am I just unlucky with them? I decided to leave and go home. The next morning, I contacted my lawyer and chose the alternative option he suggested. We discussed custody of my daughters. I will let you know as soon as everything is settled, the lawyer assured me. Nothing else was said. Five days later, I was served with a subpoena. In the meantime, I shared the evidence with everyone who knew us in an email. Laura called me many times. Did it boost your ego? She asked. Oh, definitely, I replied. Now that her true intentions have become known to everyone, I feel relieved. Have you talked to your daughters? Laura asked. I tried to explain what their mother had done, but I couldn't bring myself to reveal all the details. I just mentioned that their mother wanted to replace me with someone else, I replied. Laura asked for their reaction, to which I replied, they were furious. They made it clear that they would never allow anyone else to take my place. Has she contacted you since then? Laura asked. Yes, she was constantly calling and sending threatening messages. Even her despicable lover tried to confront me on the phone, I said with a grin. I told her to go to hell, and we both laughed. I just wanted to help, thinking that for the sake of your daughters, you will be able to establish a relationship. I never wanted to hurt you, she sighed. It doesn't hurt anymore, Laura. I just need to prepare for the battle that awaits me in court. A month later, I appeared before a judge. The letter you submitted was not in good faith, Mr. Thompson. I do not approve of your attempt to tarnish your wife's reputation, the judge scolded me. I remained silent. Mr. Thompson, would you like to comment on this? The judge asked. The question, Your Honor, I just wanted to tell the world the truth. I don't think revealing the truth should be considered a crime, I said mockingly. Judge Carlson, you claim that posting intimate images of people is illegal, but all the photos were appropriately blurred to protect people's privacy, I replied. The dispute lasted eight months. As a result, my daughter stayed with me, my wife is free, I am free, and I can keep my house for now. I hate it when she comes for the girls. The girls feel the same way every time she appears. I try my best to belittle her, which only makes the situation worse. Five months after our divorce, Alan also divorced CLA. Really ripped him off in the divorce. He was left devastated. He was kicked out of his own home, and now he has to pay a significant amount of alimony. This is the harsh reality that Alan had to face, and in the end, a month later, it led him to a mental breakdown. Alan thinks my wife is responsible for his divorce. I wanted to witness the drama unfolding. Now he lives in an apartment and pays alimony. Despite my wife's attempts to make peace with me, I stopped them before they even started. My actions clearly affected my relationship with Laura. We don't get along like we used to. For some reason, I think it's in everyone's best interest to keep their distance from my ex-wife and keep their daughters away from her. Alan and Alan did not stay together for long, and due to a lack of money, they began to quarrel frequently. And lacked what I gave her, and believe me, she had everything she wanted, expensive gifts, exclusive outfits, jewelry, traveling twice a year, and everything any woman could dream of. And she lost all that by getting involved with that loser, Alan. About three decades ago, my father, Albert, known as Big Al Lemon, bought a used truck and opened a trucking business out of Lake Charles, Louisiana. I am his only child, Albert, who is also called Little Al. Over the years, I got used to being called not Albert or Al, but Little Al. With the development of the city's economy, the Cage and Cage Company, which my father founded, also developed. My father gave the name to a company that grew to 300 trucks and 400 trailers. We now service trucks in all 48 states and Canada. I was supposed to join the company and eventually become its owner, which I sincerely agreed to. I started working in a garage at the age of 15, doing jobs such as changing tires, oil, and brakes, as well as other dirty work necessary to run a freight company. 
When I turned 18, the summer before my senior year of high school, my father decided to teach me about the family business by transferring me to an office. I quickly discovered that working in an air-conditioned room and being clean was a pleasant change from my usual duties in the garage. When I was preparing to go to college the next summer, we invited a girl to work in our security department. Her main responsibility was to check the documents that our drivers presented. I spent a lot of time in the security office, learning the importance of proper paperwork and security protocols. Her name was Jennifer Broussard. She was a year older than me and had recently graduated from a rival high school in the city. She was a stunning red-haired girl with a flawless figure, truly captivating in her beauty. I was head over heels in love with her. Throughout the summer, we spent a lot of time together, went on dates, and shared intimate moments. Although I was inexperienced, she'd already been with others before me. She was confident in herself and skillfully guided me through a new experience that left an incredible feeling. Jennifer managed to make me feel really special. She was my first, and as I discovered during college that she was the most experienced, she was natural when it came to intimacy. I learned from her that there were two other men before me, and they were all equally insecure. I don't remember how or why this detail surfaced, but it did. She liked to be intimate, and she succeeded in doing so. I was thrilled to have survived that summer with her, but all good things come to an end, or so I thought. I went to college in Baton Rouge after spending the summer with Jennifer. I wanted to stay in the city and attend the local university so that we could continue our wild adventures together, but my father had other plans. He insisted that I go to Baton Rouge, and since he was the one who paid for my education, I had no choice but to comply. I resigned myself to spending semesters either in class or in my dorm room. I had no idea that my college education in Baton Rouge would be far from boring. The first two years of college were filled with parties, lovemaking, and lots of beer. I took every opportunity to have a good time, including making love to any girl I could find. Looking back, I think my summer with Jennifer was amazing, but my college education turned out to be even more wild and unforgettable. During the first two years of my studies in Baton Rouge, I got to know the lives of other women in the area. Despite having a hard time coping with low grades, I never lost sight of Jennifer. I spent the summer in Lake Charles, where I worked for my father and continued to communicate with Jennifer. Our time together was like our first summer, filled with work and intimacy. Now, I was working in the operations department, and she was in the security department, but we still found time to be together. While I was away, my colleagues informed me about Jennifer's activities. It turned out that she had developed a close relationship with some of our truck drivers, and they often met to chat as they drove around the city. Given the specifics of our company, which covers 48 states and Canada, these drivers could spend weeks on the road without returning to Lake Charles. In addition, it was rumored that Jennifer had a more restrained relationship with a senior member of the security department, as opposed to her more open relationship with the drivers. I didn't see anything wrong with that because I did the same thing in Baton Rouge. Jennifer and I didn't have any expectations from each other, we were both free to meet other people. We didn't talk about it, but there was an understanding between us. If one of her driving friends happened to be in town, she was allowed to spend time with him. There was even a case when I found out that she was with someone else. This agreement worked well during the first summer and the early next summer, but over time, everything began to change. During my studies in Baton Rouge, I went through a period of self-discovery. I discovered a new passion for learning and was looking forward to the opportunity to expand my knowledge. I also realized that my social life had suffered. Although I still liked to have a beer sometimes and go on spontaneous adventures, I was no longer looking for wild experiences. As a result, my grades improved, and I was looking forward to returning home to work in the summer. By the third summer, I began to play a more prominent role in the operations department, practically taking a senior position. Besides, my relationship with Jennifer had changed. We spent time together just enjoying each other's company. The initial excitement associated with undressing and intimacy subsided, giving way to quiet dinners, meaningful conversations, and just a sincere appreciation of each other's presence. We went to Houston for the weekend to go to the theater, went on a five-day ocean cruise from New Orleans, and made some fun outings in Kema, Texas. Our relationship was blossoming, and it seemed to me that we were growing up together. She became someone I wanted to spend my free time with, and she seemed to feel the same way about me. Her rendezvous with the driver came to an end, and we talked about living together, but we couldn't bring it to life. My senior class schedule was light, 
classes were only held from Monday to Thursday, and weekends were free for three-day adventures.